Welcome back to my YouTube warrior. Thank you for being here for another wonderful show on Mindset and Money. And today I have a wonderful guest. Her name is Jerika Dodd, and she is a lovely uh, coach, pharmacist, and experienced leader in pharmacy. And I would love for her to share her story today and drop some nuggets uh, for you to understand and hope that will help guide your journey. So with that, I'll let her introduce herself. Well, thank you, Anne. It's so nice to uh, be on your platform, and I do appreciate the invitation. Um, as she said, I am Dr. Jerika Dodd, and I've been a pharmacist for 22 years, and I am the founder and CEO of Your Pharmacy Advocate. In addition to that, I coach women pharmacists to build their own businesses, as well as I am the executive editor of Pharmacists Magazine, celebrating women in pharmacy. And so while that's several hats, I enjoy each and every one of them because it allows me to meet uh, wonderful people, uh, patients, as well as pharmacists. And I really enjoy what I do. Awesome. Can you walk us through, not as far back as uh, where you went to pharmacy school, we can start there. Um, but just your journey, beginning journey in pharmacy. And then I know you have many years in industry as medical science liaison. So walk us through that journey a little bit. So sure. So after completing uh, my PharmD, I did complete a residency at The Ohio State University, and it was a combined master's uh, in pharmacy administration and a 24 month administration residency that had a major clinical portion to it as well. Um, I then managed a hospital pharmacy for a little under a year and then started my uh, 17 year journey in the pharmaceutical industry. I left the pharmaceutical industry in 2018 because I needed to prioritize and pay attention to myself and my health. And it's amazing as healthcare professionals, um, sometimes one of the things that we don't pay a lot of attention to uh, most is our health. And so I left uh, my job in 2018 and became a full-time entrepreneur. And we're about two years and four or five months later and um, to present day. And it's been an amazing journey. And I definitely would not trade any portion of it. Um, I even did a, an additional a degree, excuse me, at the University of Florida in applied pharmacoeconomics. And so with that, I would not trade any step along this journey because it has all culminated to where I am today. Great. Um, you know, you did the Ohio State PG01, PGY2 residency, and most of that track has where folks come out and do manager position, which you did for a year. What made you decide to transition from a hospital manager to a medical science liaison industry? And how well, did you I, make that jump? Actually, um, I first heard about the medical liaison position while I was a resident and in graduate school at The Ohio State. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting, but never really um, took the time to, to delve into it. I actually um, did look at a position that was a contract position right when I was finishing my residency, but felt that I had completed a residency and master's degree in pharmacy administration. So I should go and do what that program trained me to do, which was manage a hospital pharmacy. But once I got there, um, it was, a different world. Um, and it actually, um, the when I got the job, I was hired to be a partner of another manager that was already there. And together we were to co-manage the pharmacy. But within 90 days, I, and I can remember her during my interview, she was running around like crazy because it was just her and, the, and she needed help. Mm -hmm. So uh, 90 days after I got there, she had basically decided that though she had help, she was just you know, tired of that drive and that um, that portion of pharmacy for herself and her career. So then I became her and I turned into the manager who was running around like crazy. Um, and so lots had changed since I interviewed. And um, it just, I didn't feel that I was able to be as effective as I wanted to. It was really um, an interesting experience trying to get your arms wrapped around what had 
been determined to be a job for two people and I was but one person. Um, so that's when I began to look into the pharmaceutical industry because Eli Lilly was um, there in the same town where I was a pharmacy manager. And so um, that was the beginning of my uh, pharma industry career. Awesome. Can you, I know there are many pharmacists listening to this are very interested in industry, especially uh, MSL role. Mm -hmm. So based on your, um, wow, years of experience in MSL role and more, can you tell kind of three lessons or three advice to those pharmacists that want to transition over to pharma and what are some things they can do to help their experience? So one of the things that I think is really, really important, especially for people who don't have MSL experience or who you know don't even have industry experience, oftentimes um, I get the question, you know, how do I break into the industry? And I actually, since I left the industry, have coached uh, several uh, MSL candidates to get MSL positions. And one of the things that I think is really, really important is to not discount the experience that you have though you may not have specific MSL experience, I would look at your experience and see what transferable skills and experiences you have, where it may not, like I said, be specific MSL experience, but you have experience developing rapport and relationship with key opinion leaders or key thought leaders. And maybe it's in a different setting. It's in the setting that you've worked in. So I would look for the parallels between your experience and the experience that's being um, requested for the job. The other thing that I would do is make sure that you um, build your network and reach out and meet people who are MSLs, who are currently doing the job. I think it's, it's a great opportunity to do some discovery and find out what the job is really like, what, what could be expected. And then I think the third thing that's important for you to do is to put yourself out there and apply. Even if you read a description and it doesn't seem like you have 100% of the qualifications, I would still apply because it could be a stepping stone to people, one, even knowing that you have an interest, two, um, you may be surprised that it may be an entry-level MSL position where they are willing to look at other experiences in place of MSL experience. So those would be my top three suggestions. That's really awesome. I know I've had individuals who either students or pharmacists are always transition to wanting to transition to industry, but it is definitely like needing experience was kind of like catch 22. Yes. How do you get experience? You don't give experience, right? right. Similar to that. Um, so I know you working as, you know, from various, from using like Eli Lilly and then you switch over to uh, Bristol's Myers Squibb and then GSK. Each of those transition, how did you decide to move from one company to another? Like what was going through your, your brain as you're, you're making those decisions? So as I made the decision to move from one position to another, um, it depended on what was going on with the, um, the dynamics of the current position that I was in. But whenever I made a decision to move, it was always for a um, what I call a step up in the science, a step up in learning um, more, more difficult science um, to have more responsibility, more involvement. Um, I generally... Uh, looked at companies that I felt had a culture that was one that I could thrive in. And so it was very important for me um, not to just take the next job because there may have been an increase in pay, but look at the opportunity for growth as well as my opportunity to contribute what I could as well as learn a, uh, a different therapeutic area. Um, what would be your, can you, for those that may not be familiar with MSL, can you kind of like describe a typical day? I, I don't think there is any typical day when it comes mm -hmm. to MSL job, but as typical or expectation as an MSL role. Well, and I'll give you the perspective in that I've been out of the role for almost two and a half years. And so a lot has changed 
I'm sure because we are in the midst of a global pandemic. And so I imagine that MSL um, activity looks a lot different um, than it did when I was an MSL. But uh, as an MSL, my days varied from day to day. Um, there was quite a bit of travel included. And usually I was responsible for a territory and the, depending on the company and the size of the team, that territory could have been um, a couple of states, two or three states, or it could have been um, even larger than that, anywhere from six to seven states. And then um, in the latter portion of my career, um, I was a managed markets or outcomes liaison. Um, uh, MSL. And so that usually encompassed um, more states because you had very specific accounts that you were going to in each state. So with that, a typical day, like I said, it varied. It depends on if it was a day in the office where you could be doing administrative functions like um, uh, reporting interactions that you'd had with key opinion leaders, expense reports, um, working on internal projects, um, studying. Um, there was always, it was a job of constant learning. So I love that part about it. And then um, if it was a day where I traveled, depending on what the travel was for, I could be traveling to meet a new physician, uh, nurse or pharmacist. I could be traveling to um, connect with a speaker for the company that I was working Working with. I could have been traveling for um, a, uh, a meeting with a clinical research associate about a company sponsored trial. I could have been traveling to meet with a physician about an investigator initiated trial. So all kinds of things or a combination of those things could have been happening on any of the travel um, as well as traveling to conferences or any uh, internal meetings that happen to be out of town. So as I said, uh, quite a bit of travel, but a very, um, a very diverse group of activities any day of the week, which for me, I really enjoyed because every day was different. And I also got to um, incorporate my love of travel with the job. Wow, it sounds like there is a lot of traveling involved. And I think that's definitely a big part of it, right? And you'll be willing to go to that, like direct customers or clients you work with. What is the most rewarding part? And I think you may have answered this, but what's the most rewarding part about being MSL? Um, when I, in my tenure of being an MSL, I think the most rewarding part was um, probably uh, is a dual answer. One, it was the numerous people that I got to interact with, to support, to meet, as well as the places that I got to travel. Um, mm -hmm. I got to do some international travel in those uh, 17 years in the pharma industry. And um, I loved that part as well as I got to see even some places in the United States that I had never seen before and probably wouldn't have a reason to visit uh, now that I'm not an MSL. So I would say that the most rewarding parts were the people and uh, connecting and supporting my, um, my key opinion leaders and, as well as um, collaborating with other internal colleagues as well as the travel. And then the, the flip side, what is the most challenging aspect of being an MSL? And then I'll let you answer that first and then I'll follow another question. Oh gosh, so, and you're really digging in my in the recesses of my brain because um, I haven't thought about these things in a while because it's almost been two and a half years. Um, probably the most challenging is, was uh, for me, being able to, um, I would say being able to, sometimes it was hard to connect with people. Um, there, you would have uh, physicians, pharmacists or nurses sometimes that were limited with their interaction either because of um, the entity that they worked for or maybe they had an, an opinion of the pharma industry that didn't wasn't necessarily 
dependent on anything the company had done or not done. Um, but sometimes, you know, people that you were tasked to try and develop relationships with were not, you know, they might have been anti pharma or, like I said, had limitations due to their institution or, or their job role. So sometimes that was a bit challenging, but I would say that that was not the norm. That was probably an exception. I really enjoyed the connections that I was able to make and the, um, the ability to answer questions and, and be a resource for uh, both um, my therapeutic MSL days as well as my uh, outcomes liaison and managed markets MSL days. Yeah, and I know you went as far as medical science director prior to um, moving on to your next big entrepreneurship. So kind of want, can you walk us through, I know you were saying you focus on yourself and your health. Um, what kind of fork in the road in terms of what make you decide to leave pharma completely, all, all the things that you know of and you're stable versus going to a no territory? Walk us through that process. Oh, well, I think something happens when you get to a certain point in life um, where one, um, I think just the accumulation of being on this earth um, several, many years um, can catch up with you. And the thing that I realized is that in my on my journey, I had definitely achieved, achieved, and achieved. So you heard me mention that I had, com I've completed three degrees, I've completed a residency program, and even beyond that, I've completed a um, certificate in nutrition coaching and uh, functional medicine training and you know so on and so forth. But I, I think that the, the fork in the road came when <clears throat> I started having challenges with my health. Um, four years ago, I had to have brain surgery mm -hmm. and um, that was something that obviously, I don't think anyone plans or is, is um, penciling in on their schedule. And that was probably the first time that my health had um, had you know called my number, if you will, mm -hmm. and while it was you know not a result of work or anything that had happened, it was a mechanical problem that had to be repaired. Um, that took quite a lot uh, from me, and then um, beyond that, I continued to have uh, other health challenges that I knew I needed to just pause. It was not anything, like I said, that I planned. Um, mm -hmm. I actually uh, do think uh, oftentimes about you know, going back to industry and finishing my career. Um, but I think that for me, I just needed that pause. It had been a 17 year journey in pharmacy, I mean, in pharma, a 15 year journey as an MSL. And I think that I just needed um, a pause. I needed a break. And so, um, I think that that was probably one of the best decisions. It was one of the hardest decisions that mm -hmm. I'd made because you know we don't learn to be entrepreneurs in pharmacy school. And so here I was making decisions for my health, um, for you know the, the best for me, but yet going, oh my goodness, how is this going to work out? And so um, I'm very grateful because the set of skills that I've learned as an entrepreneur, I believe many of them um, I bring from my MSL role and my MSL days um, because I still meet and develop relationships with numerous people. You are definitely one of them. Um, so I actually spend my time connecting with people and um, not necessarily in the way that I did as an MSL, but I still uh, develop relationships. I still um, maintain rapport. I work on collaborations when it's appropriate. I speak quite a bit. Um, and I actually coach. Uh, when I was an MSL, I used to help um, train in my last position. I helped train, you know, new MSLs to the team. So I still do quite a bit of that. It looks different because I'm an entrepreneur now. But I think the skill sets that I developed you know, switching gears and going into entrepreneurship, they were quite scary in the beginning because they weren't developed, but you know, a journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. Yeah, and you said that so well, because I think you started your JD3 Enterprises back in 2014. Yes. So four years prior to leaving the pharma completely, right? And then you found your pharmacy advocate in 2017. Mm -hmm. So, 
um, like you said, in pharmacy school, I think we're taught to be pharmacists really well, but not necessarily business. Um, so what are three things that you've learned in the past few years that you would share with those who want to start their own business or at least um, start a side gig just to get it started? So um, a couple of things that I have learned that I think are so paramount is number one, your mindset. I know that uh, that's part of the title of your show is mindset. And I know that when we first talked, we talked about how important your mindset is. I tell people that literally your mindset can sink you. And when you look at the statistics of the number of people that are in business, um, you know, at two years, five years, 10 years who have started a new business, the number of people who are still still in business after, you know, two, five and 10 years, I really do believe that mindset is very important. And the reason I think that's, you know, for pharmacists to pay attention to is because we were trained in a model where unfortunately, many times I feel pharmacists derive their worth based upon giving the right answer and getting that pat on the back, that at a girl, that at a boy. And um, that's not where our worth is. And I think we're also trained not to celebrate um, our brilliance, our successes, our wins. We, um, I, I have a saying that I say often that uh, pharmacists are brilliantly insecure. And mm -hmm. so we, like I said, we derive our worth based upon giving the right answers. And granted, it's important for us to give the right answers because people's lives depend on that. However, in business, I think it's a little bit different and you need to have a mindset that will um, help to carry you because there are ups and there are downs and there's you know things that you have to learn there are mistakes that you have to make and it's interesting I, I meet and I talk to pharmacists quite often and one of the things that I find is oftentimes they don't want to make a mistake so instead of taking an action fearing that it'll be quote unquote wrong or they'll make a mistake or they won't they'll fail they would rather not do anything than to do something and try it and learn from it and move on. And so um, I think it's really important that your mindset um, be one that is supportive of you being in business. I think it's also important to understand that you need to be able to talk with more people than physicians and patients. Um, I think that you know those are where we find ourselves communicating a lot. But in business, you're going to communicate with so many other people. So learning how to have professional relationships, how to maintain them, how to have conversations such that you can talk about more than the dose of the medication that needs to be given. Wow. Yeah, I think you're right on. And I think there's a lot of like um, fear of the unknown, right? It's greater than the unknown itself, but people may always worry to sidestep to the next goal. So how did you do it in terms of you having the right mindset, but how did you overcome that quote fear slash um, anxiety and step from something from staple to really winging it, right? To make it? Well, you know, one of the things I'll tell you is that um, I believe that you will always have fear with you at all times. Like, and I know there's a book that says, feel the fear and do it anyway. And so that is literally my philosophy. Plus, oftentimes, I know um, most people, you know, won't have this uh, experience or comparison. But oftentimes, when I compare whatever it is that's before me, that's possibly, you know, eliciting fear. When I compare that to having brain surgery, I go, oh, it's nothing compared to brain surgery. And so um, while most people may not have that vantage or that perspective, I encourage you to think about things that you've overcome in the past, things that, you know, mountains that you've scaled that seemed impossible. And think about, you know, the fact that you did it. And I also believe that, um, that God did not bring me this far in my life to leave me. And so um, I have faith and I also, I make decisions. And so while I may have fear about doing something, I've made a decision that I will not worry. I don't care what it looks like, I will not worry because I believe that no matter what comes my way, 
either I'm going to have the answer, I'm going to know someone who has the answer, or someone I know is going to know someone who has the answer. And I don't believe that there's anything new under the sun. So with that, I endeavor to not focus and major on things that I don't have control over. And like I said, I surely feel fear at times, but I compare it to the successes and the wins that I've had previously. And I shrug my shoulders and go, let's do this. Wow, that's an awesome uh, mindset to have. And I think it's just being, having the right attitude, right? Like being optimistic, especially in difficult, tough times where most people may just say, whatever, let's give up and go back to the old way. Um, I think it's important, if I may, I think it's important yeah. oftentimes, and even when I'm coaching my clients, and sometimes they will like want to throw up their hands and go, there's no use, I can't, or this won't work, or what have you. And I like to think about what's possible. So no matter what the situation is, before me, what's possible? Is it possible that it could be done a different way? Is it possible that I could ask someone else for help? Is it possible that it can be um, you know, on a different schedule? What's possible? And so I think that when you start asking questions in, in, instead of passing judgment, that's when you're able to see different, um, different outcomes Mm -hmm. that are possible versus when you make a judgment and go, oh, this will never work. Well, then you're not looking for possible outcomes. You have already made a judgment or a decision that it won't work. Right. And you're going to find ways, barriers. Right. To validate your point that it won't work. Absolutely. Versus when you're asking what's possible, you're looking, how can I make this work? Okay. And you're open. You're open. Exactly. Right. You're, you're not closing the doors on yourself. You're open. Even there's a crack of hope, right? Like right. you're open and slowly like, oh, maybe this can be done. Which uh, I, I think would be really helpful for pharmacists because we are problem solvers. And so um, granted, you know, I think you have to develop, if you will, that muscle of problem solving. And I think also understanding that if you, because I think we all get stuck from time to time and we, we don't always see what's possible, but having other people in your life, be it a coach, be it a mentor, be it a support system that helps you see what's possible when you can't, such that you're less likely to, I mean, because if that's the case, problems happen every day and you could be given up all the time. But right. if you can't be optimistic, definitely surrounding yourself with people who can be and take deriving your optimism from their energy, at least until you develop that muscle of your own. I love that. And it's kind of like attitude, gratitude. So being able to be grateful for what you learn and just celebrate the small wins, right? I think we're always saying, well, I would say most pharmacists are type A and task oriented. Like when you did something, you move on to the next, you you don't really pause and stop and celebrate. Like right. I did this amazing thing or I even just simple things that you did that you never thought you have done. So take a breather and just reset your, your expectations and celebrate that little moment before you go on to, okay, what's next on the checklist, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, as the show talks about mindset, leadership, and then just financial uh, literacy. So through your journey in pharmacy school and just in life in general, for those uh, young practitioners or even students are out there listening to this, what are three advice you have when it comes to uh, financial management or personal finance? So um, my advice or my, my three bits of advice there would be number one, um, if it's not your thing, don't ignore it. Um, sometimes people who are not into finances or not wanting to be that detail oriented, it's really easy to go, oh, I'll deal with that later and later never comes. So mm -hmm. I would say um, don't ignore it because those things don't go away. And if there are problems, they actually usually grow and become snowballs, if you will, um, and they get bigger and bigger the more that you ignore them. So I think that um, and that's one of the lessons that I learned, not only with regard to finance, 
but just in general, the things that I don't understand, it's my goal to lean into them, to find out more, to go, you know, like I was never um, excited and I know this is a little bit of a tangent. I was never excited about doing live video like on social media. And so I knew that and I knew that I needed to submerge myself in that area and learn what I could in order for me to actually do it. Because I think if I had never done that, I would have found a million excuses. Mm -hmm. But I now, I, I went and like took a VIP training um, from someone uh, in the field and said, teach me what I need to know about, about making videos. And so I'm amazed at just, you know, two years later, what I'm, you know, what I'm willing to do, what I'm able to do when before I kind of shied away from it because I was like, ah, I don't really know what to do. So I say the same, the same thing about your finances. Instead of ignoring them or kind of going along to get along, I think it's important to lean into them and understand and learn and you know make that your priority to learn what it is you don't know. The other thing that I think is important, and I think this with regard to finance and, and other areas of business, is that um, when you're able, hire an expert. Um, so if you're not the best at doing your taxes, hire an expert to file your taxes. If you are not uh, you know, as detail oriented to do your bookkeeping for your business, hire someone to do that. So I think it's important to hire a professional. And then um, third, I would say it's important to, um, to set goals. It's uh, I think sometimes when you start, um, and, I, and, and I'll say set realistic goals. I think sometimes when you start, um, pharmacists, I've heard pharmacists say, you know, I want to replace my you know, six figure salary in a matter of months. And I'm like, well, <laughs> that's going to take, you know, quite a bit of work. It take, I don't think many people understand what it takes to do that. So um, the third bit of advice I would give would be to set realistic goals. Because if you don't set realistic goals, I think it's great to stretch yourself, definitely. But if you don't set realistic goals, I think that there comes the, um, the self-loathing, the, you know, the self-deprecation, if you will, when you don't reach goals that weren't realistic to meet in the first place. I think you have to give yourself a time to learn, give yourself a time to build. And unless, you know, you have like created like the next thing since, you know, the next best thing since sliced bread, give yourself time to reach the goals that you've set financially. I love that. I really love how you say hire professional, um, right? Because we have a coach for, you know, career, then your money is just as important yeah. as your career and actually your career producing. So, uh, having a financial coach and, you know, looking at fiduciary where they're looking at your best interest, not necessarily get my commission. So, I mean, they're hiring the right persons will help you along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, especially you think that's not, that's not my thing. And right. well, if it's not your thing, learn more about it, know enough to be dangerous, but then hire someone to really, truly help you. So I, I love that. And I think when you're when you're learning about it, you want to be able to know and be able to understand what the professional you've hired is saying to you or sharing with you or doing with your money. So that's why it's not just a, oh, just shove it off on the professional and let them handle everything. You still need to be aware and knowledgeable of what's going on. Right. Because in the end, it is your money. So yes. you don't want to just leave it up to somebody to decide and then look back, be like, oh, actually, I didn't make any money. It's just sitting here and earning negative 1%. And that's right. not good. Right. Um, so we're going to close it off with some really two, two fun questions. Sure. Um, so I, I call them two money mindset questions. First, if you were to win a lottery ticket, what would you splurge yourself on? Mm, I think that since you said splurge, so, you know, oftentimes we think about we would give and serve and, and help um, those less fortunate. But since you use the word splurge, yep. um, because I think that would have been my, my first answer. Um, but since you said splurge, I would splurge on travel mm -hmm. and maybe go to several of the countries I've always wanted to visit and maybe do a three to six month stay in each place, depending on, you know, where I was headed to next and 
really enjoy um, seeing the world and obviously uh, post pandemic when, when, when that's all over for us. Right, when pandemic is not part of the equation. Right, right. Where would you go, which country or which continent if you don't mind sharing? Gosh, um, so one place, I don't, and I don't know that I would necessarily want to stay three to six months, but one place that I really do want to go is Antarctica. Um, mm -hmm. I also would love to travel to Australia, New Zealand. Um, I'd like to go to Bali, Indonesia. So I have like a list of places that I don't want to wait until retirement to go. I want to be able to experience them now. And um, as I have had more friends um, go and live in other countries, like, you know, become residents of those countries, yeah. I'm like, you know, wow. Could I, could, I, could I think about doing that? But I would say at least visit and, and stay an extended period of time. That's awesome, yeah. I would love to go back to New Zealand, Australia. Mm -hmm. love, love the weather and love the hiking, well, during the summer. And there are, uh, there are several um, African countries that I would love to visit as well. Um, I actually uh, had a trip to Morocco planned for earlier uh, this year, but the wow. pandemic happened, yep. so that was all um, that was all put on hold. But yeah, I would say um, the places I listed, and then several several African countries. That's awesome. Uh, South Africa is one of my places mm -hmm. I want to to go. Mm -hmm. um, the second money mindset question is: What is the best leadership advice that you received from your role model or anyone? that you respect that money cannot buy? Um, and I would say uh, I had an experience where I learned a lesson, um, a little bit of a painful lesson. And I remember um, someone sharing with me and they just happened to be in conversation and it was someone that I highly respected um, in, in their, their business and in, in the business world. And that person said to me, that in business you want to not only work with someone because they can do the job but you want to connect and collaborate and hire or um, contract with vendors that you feel you have the same values. So everyone that you meet will not have the same value system as you. And while they may be able to complete the job, the way they go about doing it may not be uh, in uh, agreement with how you would want the, the job completed. And so that really stuck with me. So whether it's collaborating with other pharmacists, even down to um, servicing um, clients and, and patients, I really pause and um, make sure that one, th that I can help the person that's, that's coming to me for help, but two, I really pause and I listen in conversation to pick up on what their values are because I believe that that is a way to uh, avoid having um, miscommunications or um, misplaced expectations in the long run. I love that. I think that speaks volume in terms of also how you carry yourself as well in terms of with your clients, but also with people you work with. For those out there, we actually connect through LinkedIn and we met, it was supposed to be a 15 minute, but I think we talked for like an hour. An hour. Yes. Yes. Here we are. So the rest is history, just really, truly genuine connections. Mm -hmm. And uh, I firmly believe that too, is that when you're, when you're, your heart is in the right place and you're in the right, uh, you just tend to meet the right people at the right time and connect with them. Um, you know, Dr. Dodd is one of the individuals I look forward to working with and just learning from her because she has so much to share. And I really hope that you guys have listened in on a lot of things that she shared with you and really take it to heart. Um, Cause I think she accumulate 17 plus years of experience in life and more and share that with us today. So to close, if someone's interested in working with you or getting the Pharmacist Magazine, how would they contact you? So um, to get a copy of the magazine, the easiest way is to go to the website for the magazine, which is pharmacist, S-I-S, mag, M-A-G, 
pharmacistmag.com. So again, it's pharmacistmag.com. And to connect with me, um, probably the easiest way is through LinkedIn. I am on LinkedIn um, every day. And so I respond to a lot of direct messages um, that come to me that way. So um, that's probably the, the easiest way to connect with me is on LinkedIn. I am on Facebook and Instagram as well, um, but I spend more time on LinkedIn. Perfect. And I will post her LinkedIn page on the comment section as well. So my YouTube warrior, that's all I have for you today. Really, truly appreciate you watching this show. Feel free to make any more suggestions and questions. Um, I know that a very popular was industry and MSL. So that's why I bring Dr. Dodd here to share her experience and her uh, entrepreneurship. Until next time, do what you do best. Be a warrior. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you.